Hello and welcome to North Country Matters. My name is Donna Seymour. I'm a member of the St. Lawrence County Branch of the American Association of University Women, one of the civic partners for this show. Today we are hosting a conversation with Jim Bunstone, a candidate for District 10 on the St. Lawrence County Board of Legislators. Joining us is Ann Carvel, an education blogger and a resident of District 10. These nonpartisan conversations with candidates ask each candidate to explain his or her positions and ideas. We look forward to a thoughtful and civil discussion of the issues. A reminder to our audience that both candidates for District 10 were invited to appear on North Country Matters, and we filmed a conversation with the other candidate last week. Welcome, Jim Bunstone. You are running for your own seat on the St. Lawrence County Legislature for District 10, which includes most of the village of Potsdam. Uh, we have a map of that district, if you'd like to put it up on the screen so our audience can see what's included. Um, this is your second term. You'll be running for your second term. Um, so uh, the board has been working on the budget for 2011, and uh, that's always a big job. It's probably one of the biggest jobs that the board has is to prepare um, for the budget process. Uh, everything that we're reading in the newspaper tells us that county finances are the critical issue this fall. So, Jim, what do you see as the biggest issue facing the board right now uh, when it comes to your finances? The biggest issue is we want to try to keep property tax as low as possible. In our five-year plan that we developed, we um, set out a plan where it would be 0%, which is the year we're in right now, and under the tax cap for the next four years. Um, the budget we're working on right now is under the tax cap. It's actually, I believe, uh, two million dollars less than last year's budget. Um, I believe there's some cuts that we can make. Uh, they won't be big cuts to the county. They won't cut any services. They're little things that we can cut out as we as we work toward just being more efficient mm -hmm. in in how we govern, and um, so that those where those cuts are and uh, making sure that we make cuts if needed that don't affect services or employment are will be our task over the next month and a half can i follow up with you just for a second jim i know that um the county's cut in the last four years about 150 positions is there many more efficiencies to be found in terms of of personnel or not are you in, pretty much where you right, need to be? Not in terms of personnel. Um, you know, they're just how you do things. Uh, and um, so uh, we're, we're about at the end of, uh, of uh, personnel cuts. State is taking back uh, Medicaid uh, um, duties. And entirely? Not entirely. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that will, that uh, should relate to eight positions that are unfilled. Okay, these are positions that haven't been filled in a while mm -hmm. uh, that will come out of the budget. Who will, if I can follow up one more time, who's going to manage those cases? Uh, you still have a lot of cases uh, that you're going to have to manage. Yeah, I'm, I'm not fully uh, educated on that yet. Okay. Chris Radiz, who runs our uh, social services, does a very nice job, will we'll give us more information on that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see how that all works with the state being involved with the county. Uh, I know it's something that uh, people have looked for is for the state to take some of those duties. Um, and, you know, we just like to make sure that with those duties don't go in seat bodies, which like I say, at this point, those positions are all positions that haven't been filled in a while, so. Okay. And Jim, I have some questions on the budget and property taxes. The, I'm going to round numbers here, okay? The approximately $233 million tentative county spending plan would increase the tax levy from approximately $45 million to approximately $47 million. This makes it look as though the $47 million out of the $233 million comes from property taxes, which can't be true. Would you expound on that? 
with, uh, with our revenues will come projected sales tax, mm -hmm. uh, projected revenues through departments such as social services, public health, um, mental health, um, and again, you know, those are projections, and hopefully our projections are a little short and we end up with more revenue, mm -hmm. but, you know, anytime you put a, a budget together, it is an estimate, mm -hmm. and, um, and our, our people do, they, I think they do a very good job. The revenues uh, through the different departments, they're tougher because the state midstream may, they, they may cut a, uh, um, a percentage they're going to give us, and we have to react to that. Right. Jim, if I could just follow up a little bit. There's been a lot of controversy about the reserve funds, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been reported in the newspaper that in 2006 the reserve was $22 million. Once again, I'm rounding. And in 2013, approximately $8 million, 7 .8 to be exact. Do you want to expound on the controversy surrounding how that fund has gone so far down? Well, I think you go from 2006 to 2010, because that's the 2010 is when this board took, mm. took over. Mm -hmm. And we had the economics of 2008. Uh, there was a point where the state didn't have the money that was projected for us to have because of what had gone on. Mm -hmm. uh, so we ended up having to use some of our own to, to pay those. Um, and some money in that time had also, you know, been given back to taxpayers as is, you know, customary that, that you give back taxes during the budget season. Um, and it, it just slowly started to go down some now. It's starting to go back up. Uh, I believe that we may be closer to uh, nine million this year. Then I, I think the I think our projection, when it's all said and done, we we could be higher than than what we we believe. Um, you know, the thing with fund balance is right now the comptroller says we should have a fund balance around twelve million dollars, but to get fund balance, the majority of that comes from the taxpayer and, in the, and has usually come from property tax. And it's a savings account for whatever mis municipality builds that. You know, we had municipalities that had 125% fund balances. That's taxpayer money just sitting in the bank. I don't know about you, but I think I'd rather have it in my bank than the county bank or the town bank or the village bank. Um, so, you know, we've got to be careful how high we go in that fund balance also. Right. You know, Jim, you mentioned a few minutes ago you were talking about um, a projected county sales tax, and yet we know last December the board voted to raise the county portion of the sales tax from 3% to 4%, and you obviously projected that that money would be available or what you thought would be right. that money to be available. And yet what we've seen this year is that the county may fall a $1.8 million short of that projection in terms of uh, the sales tax. So how, how, are you, you know, how are you basing more money coming in from sales tax when you didn't see it this year? Well, and that, you know, we need to rely on our treasurer, Kevin Felt. And I think Kevin does a nice job um, to give us his best estimate on that. Um, you know, of course, we couldn't foresee the awful winter we had, um, you know, which directly affects, I mean, people spent a lot of money on fuel oil, on wood, didn't go out, you know, didn't go to the stores often as, as they or, would. Or couldn't afford to or they were afford spending it, it on yeah. fuel oil and wood, um, right? Yeah. You know, for my district, where a big portion of the property is non-taxable, as you both oh, know, yes, we do. Right. <laughs> to have a sales tax where our 9,000 visitors who spend a lot of money help contribute because they're on, you know, non-taxable properties for the most part. I mean, we do have our renter, you know, our people that rent. It, it's, a, it's a bonus for, and that money that came in 
Part of that went to the village of Potsdam, and part of that went to the town of Potsdam, as it did every town and village. So it didn't just help the county. It helped all the municipalities. What they do with it is, you know, is up to them. Right. But it's money that, that they, they wouldn't have had. Uh, Jim, the state comptroller, Thomas DiNapoli, has reported that St. Lawrence County is one of the most fiscally stressed municipalities in the state. On top of that, let me just lead into the issue of infrastructure. Um, it has been stated that we would need to spend $285 million over the next decade to fix deficient bridges, roads, and other uh, important uh, parts of our infrastructure. Given uh, our status as a highly stressed county, what is the hope of dealing with the infrastructure? Well, the, the hope is, and actually in this budget, we, there is a capital reserve for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, and we're looking at the budget and can we maybe take money out of a department or out of a, out of a department and put, it, put more money into that capital reserve um, and continue that to grow. I mean, we've got a long ways to go with the highway department. You know, we talked about the $22 million fund balance. Well, that problem existed back when that $22 million fund balance was there. It would have been nice if at that time they'd have taken some of that money and put it into infrastructure money. That was their choice, and, and they had a plan, and, and they didn't. Now we're sitting here today with the bridges, with, with the roads as they are. And uh, some have actually been closed. Some of the some, roads have been closed. Some of the bridges have right. had to have been closed some have because be there haven't been repaired. Right. Uh, we have Don Chambers, a new uh, highway department uh, head. Uh, he's done a very good job. He has a plan. He was quite successful down in Cortland County, uh, where he was previously. Um, and one of our jobs in this budget and in future budgets is to send as much money that way as much money that way as we can. It's part of the five-year plan that, that we put together was to build that. And uh, I mean, we're not gonna reach the, the numbers that he's talked about in the next four years. Well, it took 20 years to get into exactly. this hole, so it's gonna yeah. take some time to yeah. get out, that's for sure, yeah. You know, um, you mentioned um, a few minutes ago about the thing that we all remember and kind of shudder when we think about, which was that winter last year and not knowing what the next one comes. Um, one of the things that the county does that the state does not do is charge sales tax on fuel oil. That is incredibly regressive on anybody yeah. who's at the lower end of the income scale or even at the middle end of the income scale in terms of that. Um, is that something that you think the county should revisit because uh, there are people who are making choices, and they're not very good choices, about whether you, you buy groceries this week or you pay your fuel bill. That's, that's a tough choice yeah. for people to make, and 4% would save a little bit anyway. And then the state doesn't charge it, so why right. does the county? Why the county does, I don't know. That, that's been the, uh, um, and the way they've done business for long before I got there. Uh, I do believe that if we can continue to get the fund balance where we need it and uh, we can look at that sales tax, I, I agree with you. I mean, I pay it as well as anybody else and it does make winter difficult. Um, I think that if the, if the plan continues, you'll see that discussion take place and you'll actually, if, if it's up to me, I would vote yes uh, to to decrease that or maybe eliminate it. We can't do it right now. I, I, I think that'd be a tough thing for us to do mm -hmm. today or in this next budget. Could but you do it by December? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do. You know, I mean, the, the uh, Karen St. Hilaire and her staff prepared a very good budget, uh, the best one since I've been there. Um, and they're really, like I say, there aren't a lot of cuts but there's some here and some there. Uh, I certainly wouldn't promise anything, but let's wait and see. Okay. It'd, be, it'd be a nice discussion wouldn't to it? have anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, in your opinion, what's the biggest roadblock to making the kind of progress you'd like to see on the county board? 
our biggest, well, we have a good board right now, uh, Democrats and Republicans, work well together, they argue, but they work well together. Um, uh, I think more of the roadblocks are the state mandates um, and the way sometimes things get changed halfway through the year, uh, funding really. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's tough. We had a, a money promise to us for the trail system that all of a sudden was taken away and then given back. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, our budgets are tight, everybody's budgets are tight, home budgets are tight. You, when something like that happens, it, it, it makes it very hard to, to move forward the way you want to. Right. Thanks, Jim. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, poverty, which um, is one of the earmarks of life in St. Lawrence County, sadly, for way too many people. Um, we have a big social services budget. Uh, I know you say that the state's going to at least take over some of the administrative duties, even if that doesn't mean that they are more timely in their reimbursements <laughs> right. to us. But, you know, there's food stamps, winter heating help, Medicaid, all of those kinds of things that have to be provided for for people who are in very dire straits. Um, just last week at SUNY Potsdam there was a, a, a discussion, a panel discussion of four experts and they agreed that the issues of poverty, hunger and homelessness have reached a crisis point in St. Lawrence County. And um, they see it not only as just a, an immediate problem but it's a generational problem. What ideas do you have to address this because it's been around for a long time and it's not going anywhere and it seems to be getting worse and from the county point of view, it gets to be a bigger and bigger part of what you have to manage. So how can we change the, the fundamentals of that dynamic? That's, that's, a, that's a hard one because we do, we have, we have a huge amount of poverty um, and we need to find a way to bring those people out of it. Now, fortunately, I think last year at this time, unemployment was like 10 percent and then right now it's around seven seven point six something so there's there's more jobs or there's more people working or there's fewer people looking which is can be one of the right. problems with that measure um, yeah. honestly a, a tough part in that mix is that there's people that uh, you know they they'll take a job but they'll find that what they end up making isn't that much better than if they were on public assistance um, and that becomes generational but and that's too many low-income jobs mm -hmm. which right. is a result Hopefully, of some of the types of employers who unfortunately right. are are and work are you know they're providing work here in this county you know hopefully the minimum wage increase mm -hmm. uh, will help that issue um, you know for the county I mean the county is services that's a function of, of government as services. We provide those services, um, but uh, we need to step out of the box and not just provide the services, but find programs that, you know, and they've tried the, uh, you know, get people back to work programs. We, we need to- Re-education programs, yeah. things like that. And yeah. We need to step out of the box and come up with plans or opportunities for people. Uh, what those are, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I mean, those are discussions that we should have. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, maybe as the, the budgeting and things start to at least roll towards a better tomorrow, we can spend more time with that. Right. Okay, Jim, I have two questions for you that are tied to each other. They're on climate change, the first one. Do you agree with the scientific consensus that global warming poses a significant threat to the planet? Yeah. You do? Okay. Yes. And so the... apparently does the Pentagon, who just put out a report <laughs> yeah. this week. So, so that's <laughs> you and the Pentagon. <laughs> okay, on to part B. On a local level, do you believe that global warming is putting real economic stress on us because of the fact that we have to deal with what appears to be very extreme weather conditions in the winter that impact the demand for heat and the need for people to get help with their heating. Yeah, I, I mean, again, we'll just go back to last winter. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's, there's home repair programs. 
Um, you know, the county's good at, at taking advantage of those grants. Uh, um, Mr. Hans is always getting those grants because those houses are the same houses that apply for HEAP. Mm -hmm. And so if they're not weather tight, then we spend more money with, or with the HEAP. Now, the HEAP dollars have gone down and those dollars have gone up. Um, and we know uh, last winter fuel oil was about four dollars a right. gallon, so um, it didn't go very far. Those dollars. No, they didn't. Yeah. And um, and uh, you know, I think I think people have to be conscious and and do whatever they can on their own to winterize their homes, but take advantage of those grants. And and then there's the people that don't um, don't qualify for those grants. Mm -hmm. You know that. Uh, that was the, now those fuel costs are coming out of their pocket, which leads to you know not not the money to buy the groceries to to maybe, maybe skimp on the health care or exactly. prescriptions the whole and thing. Yeah. So you know I mean one thing that we could do at the county level is try to provide education on weatherization for for the people that don't you know well for for everybody not just the people that are uh, grant eligible, but the ones that aren't, that maybe they just, you know, aren't, aren't quite sure how to seal their windows or doors and prepare for lovely winters like last year. Well, you know, um, it, it's interesting. Um, do you have any idea how many, um, I know that weatherization programs run out of the, the uh, CDP program. Do you know how many houses are actually um, uh, weatherized each year in the county? I don't. Okay. I, I don't. I can get you that come back next week. Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, one of the, uh, I was listening to a, a radio program the other day. There was a panel of mayors from around the country on it, and they were talking that their main job is to solve problems because that's really their, you know, they're, they're in it up to their elbows in terms of trying to, you know, fix, fix uh, things that are going on in their communities. Um, and one of the mayors said that he and his board sat down and they decided that one way to become a more attractive community that would bring in business, that would bring in new people, was to really work on quality of life issues. And um, we know in St. Lawrence County, out of the 62 counties in New York, we rank 55th for poor health. So clearly that is a, a huge issue. I mean, it, it impacts uh, the work that uh, the county has to do on Medicaid and other things like that. How can, um, how can we improve the quality of life here in a way that makes us more attractive to people to come in or at least to keep the young people that we have instead of them always leaving uh, and going somewhere else? Well, I think with the, with the study that uh, puts us as low as it does, um, one of the major factors there is the amount of poverty we have. Um, which leads to childhood obesity. Uh, uh, I sit on the Board of Health okay. and, and we talk about that. And uh, one of our doctors is, you know, hates hate Pop-Tarts. He talks mm -hmm. about kids eating Pop-Tarts. One of the other doctors says, well, you know, Pop-Tarts are 99 cents. Fruit is a lot more than 99 cents. And, and that's, that's a fact. Um, and people live in places where they don't have access to grocery stores with a big variety. Lots of right. rural communities, you right. don't, you have a, a gas station. That's your little local grocery store. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, the quality of life, it's, it's a beautiful area. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, we have good school systems. Um, health is, is, again, you know, we've got generations uh, now. If you're genetically cancer sensitive, you know, that's going to factor into this, um, whether you live in northern New York or central New York or Texas. Um, but uh, I, I think as far as bringing people in, we need to sell this area more and more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned I'm on the Board of Health right now. We're hiring, looking for a new uh, director of the Board of Health. And that's what we, we're doing right now is selling the North Country. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have our health issues. You know, we do have the cancer issues. We do have the um, the childhood obesity issues. Um, but 
when you look at the colleges we have, the school systems we have, uh, you know, uh, the fact that we don't have traffic jams, you know, I mean, the quality isn't bad, but there is that group that, that struggles. If I could step away for a minute, um, our phys ed program in our local, in our state schools could be uh, a little more in tune with that. You know, we spend, a, I have a 13 year old who tells me, you know, they take tests when they could be playing. And, mm -hmm. and, and he's 100% correct. And, you know, he, he says, you know, they talk about childhood obesity and then we have to sit down and we have to, to you know, talk about this and take a test about this. Um, More safe time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and teach, you know, teach. Uh, when, when I was in New York City doing, and I did my student teaching, we had a class called Slim Gym. And it was for young ladies and it was designed for people that were 20% or greater in body fat, and that's teenage years. And we had a class of 40 students, and we would teach them exercise programs, dietary programs, um, and uh, and some of them went went to it and did very very well. But uh, you know, like I say, the the quality of life. I love it here. Uh, we need more jobs. That'll keep people here. Need more, better paying jobs. That'll keep people here. I have a 20 year old right now, junior at this university. Um, where he'll be in you know, two years, I don't know. Um, talked to a young man from uh, Manhattan the other day who is at SUNY Canton. And uh, he plans on staying here and living here. Loves it. So. That's good. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our um, half hour with you, Jim. And um, there's yeah. always uh, there's always things to talk about that we didn't get to, but we'll just have to um, leave it here for for this time. We want to remind our viewers that election day is November fourth. Be sure that you are registered to vote and that you know who's on the ballot that you will be electing. Take the time to find out what their positions are on the issues that you care about. Thank you. These conversations are a production of North Country Matters, produced here in the studios of WCKN on the campus of Clarkson University. This show is a civic collaboration between the St. Lawrence County branch of the American Association of University Women, the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters, and the Communications and Media Department of Clarkson University. Until next time, remember, our North Country Matters. Thank you, Jim. Very, Very much. Good.